We're going to read chapter six and probably chapter seven together, if my voice can hold out that long. You'll see why once we get going. Chapter six, the adventures of Eustace. Remember, he went up the hill to try and get away from everybody so he didn't have to help out with all the hard work after the storm. And then he thought he was lonely and for the first time he kind of wanted to be with them. And so he rushed back down the hill but it was foggy and he couldn't see where he was going. And when he got to the bottom and the fog lifted, he was in an utterly unknown valley and the sea was nowhere in sight. His friends were close to the shore because they could see the ship, remember? Now he's not anywhere even close to the shore. So he's very lost. The Adventures of Eustace. At that very moment, the others were washing hands and faces in the river and generally getting ready for dinner and a rest. The three best archers had gone up into the hills north of the bay and returned with a pair of wild goats, which were now roasting over a fire. They were wild, so if you have pet goats, don't worry. Caspian had ordered a cask of wine ashore, strong wine of Archenland, which had to be mixed with water before you drank it, so that there would be plenty for everyone. The work had gone well so far, and it was a very merry meal. Only after the second helping of goat did Edmund say, Where's that blighter, Eustace? Meanwhile, Eustace stared round the unknown valley. It was so narrow and deep, and the precipices which surrounded it were so sheer that it was like a huge pit or a trench. The floor was grassy, though strewn with rocks, and here and there Eustace saw black burnt patches like those you see on the sides of a railway embankment in a dry summer. About 15 yards away from him was a pool of clear, smooth water. There was, at first, nothing else at all in the valley. Not an animal, not a bird, not an insect. The sun beat down and grim peaks and horns of mountains peered over the valley's edge. Eustace realized, of course, that in the fog, he had come down the wrong side of the ridge. So he turned at once to see about getting back. But as soon as he had looked, he shuddered. Apparently, he had, by amazing luck, found the only possible way down, a long green spit of land, horribly steep and narrow, with precipices on each side. There was no possible way of getting back. But could he do it? Now that he saw what it was really like, there was no other possible way of getting back, I meant to say. And now he wondered if he could do it now that he actually saw what it was really like. His head swam at the very thought of it. He turned around again, thinking that at any rate, he'd better have a good drink from the pool first. But as soon as he had turned and before he had taken a step forward into the valley, he heard a noise behind him. It was only a small noise, but it sounded loud in that immense silence. It froze him dead still where he stood for a second. And then he slewed around his head and looked. At the bottom of the cliff, a little on his left hand was a low, dark hole. The entrance to a cave, perhaps. And out of this, two thin wisps of smoke were coming and the loose stones just beneath the dark hollows were moving that was the noise that he had heard just as if something were crawling in the dark behind them something was crawling worse still something was coming out now edmund or lucy or you probably would have recognized it at once but eustace had read none of the right books the thing that came out of the cave was something that he had never even imagined. A long, lead-colored snout, dull red eyes, no feathers or fur, a long, lithe body that trailed on the ground, legs whose elbows went up higher than its back like a spider's, cruel craws, bat's wings that made a rasping noise on the stones, and yards of tail and the two lines of smoke were coming from its two nostrils. He had never said the word dragon to himself, nor would it have made things any better if he had. 
but perhaps if he had known something about dragons, he would have been a little surprised at this dragon's behavior. It did not sit up and clap its wings, nor did it shoot out a stream of flame from its mouth. Here is a picture first of what he saw in the cave, and then what he saw as it was coming out. Hmm. I dropped my book. I have to reach down and get it. You see my dragon here? This is a kit that I got. And these are supposed to flap. There's a little thing you twist and they're supposed to flap, but it doesn't really work. But it's cool anyway. Here's my other dragon that I brought for you to see. This looks silly. It doesn't look like a real one. I mean, it looks like a, a fake pet dragon, right? It's like got shiny wings and it's blue. Dragons don't look nice like that. They're not fuzzy and soft. They are like flying snakes with claws, with bat wings. The smoke from its nostrils will, was like the smoke of a fire that you know will not last much longer. Nor did it seem to have noticed Eustace. It moved very slowly towards the pool, slowly and with many pauses. Even in his fear, Eustace felt that it was an old, sad creature. He wondered if he dared make a dash for the ascent for the hill. But it might look round if he made any noise, and it might come more to life. Perhaps it was only shamming and faking. Anyway, what was the use of trying to escape by climbing from a creature that could fly? It reached the pool and slid its horrible scaly chin down over the gravel to drink. But before it had drunk, there came from it a great croaking or clanging cry and after a few twitches and convulsions it rolled around on its side and it lay perfectly still with one claw in the air. A little dark blood gushed from its wide opened mouth. The smoke from the nostrils turned black for a moment and then floated away and no more came. For a long time, Eustace did not dare to move. Perhaps this was just the brute's trick, the way it lured travelers to their doom. But one couldn't wait forever. He took a step nearer, then two steps, and then he halted again. The dragon remained motionless. He noticed, too, that the red fire had gone out of its eyes. At last, he came right up to it, and he was quite sure now that it was dead. With a shudder, he touched it. Nothing happened. The relief was so great that Eustace almost laughed out loud. He began to feel as if he had fought and killed the dragon instead of merely seeing it die. Do you remember when Edmund saw the stone lion in the white witch's house? And he was afraid of it at first because he thought it was real and was going to attack him. And then when he got up there and realized it was stone, he kind of laughed at it and drew on it. That's kind of what happened with Eustace here. He's afraid of the dragon, and then he realizes it's dead, and now he feels like it was no big deal. He stepped over the dragon and went to the pool for his drink, for the heat was getting unbearable. He was not surprised when he heard a big peal of thunder, and almost immediately afterwards, the sun disappeared, and before he had finished his drink, big drops of rain were falling. The climate of this island was a very unpleasant one. In less than a minute, Eustace was wet to the skin and half-blinded with such rain as one never sees in Europe. There was no use trying to climb out of the valley as long as this lasted, so he bolted for the only shelter in sight, the dragon's cave. And there he lay down and tried to get his breath. Now, most of us know what we should expect to find in a dragon's lair. But as I said before, Eustace had read only the wrong books. They had a lot to say about exports and imports and governments and drains, but they were weak on dragons. That's why he was so puzzled at the surface on which he was lying. Parts of it were too prickly to be stones and too hard to be thorns. And there seemed to be a great many round, flat things. 
and it all clinked when he moved. There was light enough at the cave's mouth to examine it by, and of course, Eustace found it to be what any of us could have told him in advance. Treasure. There were crowns, those were the prickly things, corn, coins, rings, bracelets, ingots, cups, plates, and gems. Eustace, unlike most boys, had never thought much of treasure, but he saw at once the use it would be in this new world, which he had so foolishly stumbled into through the picture in Lucy's bedroom at home. They don't have any tax here, he said, and you don't have to give treasure to the government. With some of this stuff, I could have quite a decent time here. Perhaps in Callerman. It sounds the least phony of these countries. I wonder how much I can carry. That bracelet now, those things in it are probably diamonds. I'll just slip that on my own wrist. It's too big, but not if I push it up right up here above my elbow. So put it right up here. Then fill my pockets with diamonds. That's easier than gold. I wonder when this infernal rain is going to let up. He got into a less uncomfortable part of the pile where it was mostly coins and he settled down to wait. But a bad fright when once it is over and especially a bad fright following a mountaintop walk leaves you very tired. And so Eustace fell asleep. By the time he was sound asleep and snoring, the others had finished dinner and were seriously alarmed about him. They shouted, Eustace! Eustace, cooey, till they were hoarse, and Caspian blew his horn. He's nowhere near or he'd have heard that, said Lucy with a white face. Confound the fellow, said Edmund. What on earth did he want to slink away like this for? But we must do something, said Lucy. He may have gotten lost or fallen into a hole or been captured by savages or killed by wild beasts, said Drinian. And good riddance if he has, I say, muttered Rince. Master Rince, said Reepicheep, you never spoke a word that became you less. The creature is no friend of mine, but he is of the queen's blood. And while he is one of our fellowship, it concerns our honor to find him and to avenge him if he is dead. Of course we've got to find him if we can, said Caspian wearily. That's the nuisance of it. It means a search party and endless trouble. Bother, Eustace. Meanwhile, Eustace slept and slept and slept. What woke him was a pain in his arm. The moon was shining in at the mouth of the cave, and the bed of treasures seemed to have grown much more comfortable. In fact, he could hardly feel it at all. He was puzzled by the pain in his arm at first, but presently it occurred to him that the bracelet which he had shoved up above his elbow had become strangely tight. His arm must have swollen up while he was sleeping. It was his left arm. He moved his right arm in order to feel his left, but stopped before he had moved it an inch and he bit his lip in terror. For just in front of him and a little on his right, where the moonlight fell clear on the floor of the cave, he saw a hideous shape moving. He knew that shape now. It was a dragon's claw. It had moved as he moved his hand and then become still when he stopped moving his hand. Oh, what a fool I've been, thought Eustace. Of course, the brute has a mate and it's lying beside me. For several minutes, he didn't dare move a muscle. He saw two thin columns of smoke going up before his eyes, black against the moonlight, just as there had been smoke coming from the other dragon's nose before it died. This was so alarming that he held his breath. The two columns of smoke vanished. When he could hold his breath no longer, he let it out stealthily. Instantly, two jets of smoke appeared again. But even yet, he had no idea of the truth. You probably do. Presently, he decided that he would edge very cautiously to his left and try to creep out of the cave. Perhaps the creature was asleep, and anyway, it was his only chance. 
But of course, before he edged to the left, he looked to the left. Horrors! There was a dragon's claw on that side, too! No one will blame Eustace if at this moment he shed some tears. He was very surprised at the size of his own tears as he saw them splashing onto the treasure in front of him. They also seemed strangely hot. Steam went up from them. But there was no good crying. He must try to crawl out from between the two dragons. So he began extending his right arm. And that dragon's foreleg and claw on his right went through exactly the same motion. Then he thought he would try his left. But the dragon limb on that side moved too. Two dragons, one on each side, mimicking whatever he did. His nerve broke and he simply made a bolt for it. There was such a clatter and rasping and clinking of gold and grinding of stones as he rushed out of the cave that he thought they were both following him. He didn't look back. He rushed right to the pool. The twisted shape of the dead dragon lying in the moonlight would have been enough to frighten anyone, but now he hardly noticed it. His idea was to get into the water, I guess to hide. But just as he reached the edge of the water, the pool, two things happened. First of all, it came over him like a thunderclap that he had been running on all fours, meaning arms and legs. And why on earth had he been doing that? And secondly, as he bent towards the water, he thought for a second that yet another dragon was staring up at him out of the pool. But in an instant, he finally realized the truth. That dragon face in the pool was his own reflection. There was no doubt about it. It moved as he moved. It opened and shut its mouth as he opened and shut his. He had turned into a dragon while he was asleep. Sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy dragonish thoughts in his heart, he had become a dragon himself. That explained everything. There had been no two dragons beside him in the cave. The claws to the right and the left had been his own right and left claws. The two columns of smoke had been coming from his own nostrils. And as for the pain in his left arm, or what had been his left arm, he could now see what had happened by squinting with his left eye. The bracelet, which had fitted very nicely on the upper arm of a boy, was obviously far too small for the thick, stumpy foreleg of a dragon. It had sunk deeply into his scaly flesh, and there was a throbbing bulge on each side of it. He tore at the place with his dragon's teeth, but he couldn't get it off. In spite of the pain, his first feeling was one of relief. There was nothing to be afraid of anymore. He was a terror himself now, and nothing in the world but a knight, and not even all of those, would dare to attack him. He could get even with Caspian and Edmund now. But the moment he thought this, he realized that he didn't want to. He wanted to be friends. He wanted to get back among humans and talk and laugh and share things. He realized that he was a monster cut off from the whole human race. And an appalling loneliness came over him. And he began to see that the others had not really been fiends at all. He even began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person as he, has, as he had always supposed. He longed for their voices. He would have been grateful for a kind word even from Reepicheep. When he thought of this, the poor dragon that had been Eustace lifted up its voice and wept powerful dragon crying its eyes out under the moon in a deserted valley is a sight and sound hardly to be imagined. You see, he's not soft and plush and cushy like my little play dragon. He's gross like a real dragon. At last, he decided that he would try to find his way back to the shore. 
he realized now that Caspian would never have sailed away and left him. And he felt sure that somehow or other he would be able to make people understand who he was. He took a long drink and then, I know this sounds shocking, but it isn't if you just think it over. He ate nearly all of the dead dragon. He was halfway through it before he realized what he was doing. For you see, though his mind was the mind of Eustace, his tastes and his digestion were dragonish. And there is nothing a dragon likes so well as fresh dragon. That's why you so seldom find more than one dragon in the same country, in case you didn't know that. Then he turned to climb out of the valley. He began to climb with a jump, and as soon as he jumped, he found that he was flying. He'd quite forgotten about his wings, and it was a great surprise to him. Actually, the first pleasant surprise that he'd had for a long time. He rose high into the air, and he saw innumerable mountaintops spread out beneath him in the moonlight. He could see the bay like a silver slab, and he could see the Don Treader lying at anchor, and he could see campfires twinkling in the woods beside the beach. From a great height, he launched himself down towards them in a single glide. Lucy was sleeping very sound, for she had sat up till the return of the search party in hope of good news about Eustace. It had been led by Caspian and had come back late and weary, and their news was very disquieting. They had found no trace of Eustace, but they had seen a dead dragon in a valley. That must have been when Eustace was in the cave sleeping. They tried to make the best of it, and everyone assured everyone else that there were not likely to be more dragons about, and that one which was dead at about three o'clock in the afternoon, which was when they had seen it, would hardly have been killing and eating people a very few hours before. Unless it ate the little brat and died of him, he'd poison anything, said Rince. But he said this under his breath, and no one heard it. Except you now. But later in the night, Lucy was waked, very softly, and found the whole company gathered close together and talking in whispers. What is it? said Lucy. We must all show great constancy, Caspian was saying. A dragon has just flown over the treetops and landed on the beach. Yes, I am afraid it is between us and the ship, and arrows are no use against dragons, and they're not at all afraid of fire. With your majesty's leave, began Reepicheep. No, Reepicheep, said the king very firmly. You are not going to attempt a single combat with it. And unless you promise to obey me in this matter, I'll have you tied up. Because Reepicheep is always ready to fight. We must just keep close watch, and as soon as it's light, we'll go down to the beach and give it battle. I will lead. King Edmund will be on my right, and the Lord Drinian on my left. There are no other arrangements to be made. It will be light in a couple of hours. In an hour's time, let a meal be served out, and what is left of the wine also, and let everything be done silently. Perhaps it will go away, said Lucy. It'll be worse if it does, said Edmund, because then we shan't know where it is. If there's a wasp in the room, I like to be able to see it. The rest of that night was dreadful, and when the meal came, though they knew they ought to eat, many found that they had very poor appetites. An endless hour seemed to pass before the darkness thinned and the birds began chirping here and there, and the world got colder and wetter than it had been all night, and Caspian finally said, Now for it, friends. So they got up, all with their swords drawn, and they formed themselves into a solid mass with Lucy in the middle and reap a cheap on her shoulder. It was nicer than the waiting about, and everyone felt fonder of everyone else than at ordinary times. And a moment later, they were marching. It grew lighter as they came to the edge of the wood, and there, on the sand, like a giant lizard, or a flexible crocodile, or a serpent with legs, huge and horrible and humpy legs, lay the dragon. But when it saw them, instead of rising up and blowing fire and smoke, 
the dragon retreated, you could almost say it waddled, back into the shallows of the bay. It's probably really hard for dragons to walk backwards because their tail is back there. What's it wagging its head like that for? said Edmund. And now it's nodding, said Caspian. And there's something coming from its eyes, said Drinian. Can't you see, said Lucy? It's crying. Those are tears. I shouldn't trust to that, ma'am, said Drinian. That's what crocodiles do, just to put you off your guard. It wagged its head when you said that, remarked Edmund, just as if it had meant no. Look, there it goes again. Do you think it understands what we're saying? said Lucy. The dragon nodded its head violently. Reap a cheap slipped off Lucy's shoulders and stepped to the front, because that's what Reap a cheap always does. Dragon, came his shrill voice. Can you understand speech? The dragon nodded. Can you speak? It shook its head. Then, said Reap a cheap, it's idle to ask you your business, but if you will swear friendship with us, raise your left foreleg above your head. It did so, but clumsily, because that was the leg that was sore and swollen with the golden bracelet. Oh, look, said Lucy, there's something wrong with its leg. The poor thing, that's probably what it was crying about. Perhaps it came to us to be cured, like in Androcles and the Lion. That's a, a fable from Aesop's fable. I think that's what it's from. Be careful, Lucy, said Caspian. It's a very clever dragon but it may be a liar. Lucy, however, had already run forward, followed by Reepicheep as fast as his short little legs could carry him, and then, of course, the boys and Drinian came too. Show me your poor paw, said Lucy. I might be able to cure it with her little diamond bottle, remember? The dragon that had been Eustace held out its sore leg gladly enough remembering how Lucy's cordial had cured him of seasickness before he became a dragon. But he was disappointed. The magic fluid reduced the swelling, and it eased the pain a little bit, but it could not dissolve the gold. Everyone had now crowded round to watch the operation, and Caspian suddenly exclaimed, Look! He was staring at the bracelet. We're going to stop and we'll read chapter seven next.